Hello, everyone. Thank you for your interest and participation in the development of our nation's offshore renewable energy program. And thank you in particular for your interest in activities in the New York Bight area. My name is Jim Bennett. I am the program manager for our offshore renewables program. And we're all very pleased to see the continued growth in the offshore uh, wind market in the United States, thanks to decreasing global costs, stronger state policy commitments, and this administration's commitment to American energy. The briefing you are about to hear is designed to provide an overview of BOEM's draft wind energy areas in the New York Bight, which are to be the topic of conversation at the New York Bight Task Force meeting on November 28th at the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York City. Hopefully, after listening to this presentation, you will have an understanding of how the draft wind energy areas were selected and can come prepared to the task force meeting to discuss how these areas may impact your existing or future uses of the OCS in this region. The Department of the Interior, through the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, oversees energy and minerals development on the Outer Continental Shelf, or OCS which typically starts three nautical miles offshore and extends to 200 nautical miles to the limits of the exclusive economic zone. That's a total of 2.3 billion acres. We specifically have a mandate to expeditiously develop energy resources on the OCS. And this mandate includes wind energy or sources other than oil and gas as defined in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Working with affected stakeholders and state renewable energy task forces over the past decade or so, we've been involved in, in a multi-year process to identify areas and lease areas offshore for wind energy development. BOEM currently has 12 active commercial leases on the East Coast for wind energy development. From Cape Cod to Cape Hatteras, every state has at least one commercial wind energy development lease offshore. This has great potential to contribute to the nation's energy supply, uh, energy diversity, and energy security. We are now actively working with our leases as they plan and design these infrastructure projects. We have approved six site assessment plans for, for projects on the Atlantic, which allow companies to deploy instruments to assess ocean conditions and wind conditions in their lease areas. Also, we have received two construction and operations plans, one from Vineyard Wind for a project offshore Massachusetts and a second from Deepwater Wind for a project offshore Rhode Island. The states of New York and New Jersey have both taken strong leadership roles and between them have called for almost six gigawatts of offshore wind development. We at BOEM are trying to fulfill our role to ensure a steady stream of leasing opportunities for wind energy development. We have started in this area with a very large study area uh, and sub areas for consideration as originally proposed by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. We have issued a call for information and based on our response, the responses to that call, uh, today we would like to share with you our draft wind energy areas for the New York Bite and discuss the analysis that went into the identification of these wind energy areas. These wind energy areas are the next step, an important step, in the ultimate identification of specific areas to be auctioned for wind energy development. And with that, I would like to turn this over to our project coordinator for the New York Bite, Luke Feinberg. Thank you, Jim. So before we jump into the actual draft wind energy areas themselves, just want to make sure everybody is clear into what a wind energy area is. You know, officially it's a portion of the Outer Continental Shelf, or OCS, that BOEM identifies to conduct our NEPA assessment on, or environmental assessment. And that environmental assessment will assess the 
potential impacts of site characterization activities in those areas. It's also the basis for a lease area. So how do we get to a wind energy area? So the map, that you're, or the schematic here you're going to see um, is, is an effort to display that. So you start with a call area, this area in green, and that is a, a much larger area than we intend to lease, and that's what's represented by the previous slide that Jim just described. Then you determine through a, a, a winnowing process the wind energy area. And this wind energy area is what we're talking about today. And traditionally, our, our program has taken that wind energy area and then that has become the lease area. So they've leased, uh, the program has leased the entire area itself. It's also possible that we could divide a wind energy area into separate lease areas. And this is just a schematic. Um, there's no meaning to the number four there, uh, four areas particularly, but I uh, just wanted to be clear that the, the process here is we're going from a call area to a wind energy area to a lease area, which may include many or several lease areas within that wind energy area. So how did we get to a wind energy area? Well, we considered many, many factors. Um, and it's just, you know, there really is no portion of the New York Bight that is uh, free space or that is that's not have a current use so these are the the major factors the factors that really rose to the top of our analysis and these are the factors that we conducted analysis on um, through with our our subject matter experts or or conducting uh, additional outreach to uh, folks like the coast guard or department of defense so these include the developer nominations that were submitted in response to the call for information nominations recreational and commercial fishing activity, visual impacts from a potential facility, marine protected species and areas that they need for their continued population abundance, uh, avian species, submarine cables, radar, wind resources or wind speeds, uh, vessel navigation, the Department of Defense and their interests in, in continuing their air use of this area to support their missions and cost of development of a wind energy facility. So the, this map shows the draft wind energy areas. And there's a couple things I want to point out. The first is that you'll see there's a light green color and a dark green color, and those have different meanings. The dark green is what we're calling a primary recommendation. These are the areas that relative to everything else within the call area, we are considering to be uh, less conflicted. So if you were to take all those dark areas and add them up, uh, that contains about 313,000 acres, which has the potential to conservatively produce 3.8 gigawatts of energy. There are also light green areas, and these light green areas are areas that we also think have a very high potential for offshore wind development, um, as well as having relatively less conflict compared to everything else in the area, but they're not quite as deconflicted. They don't have, they have some additional issues we'll discuss. And really, we're trying to highlight those areas as areas we'd like the task force to focus on and say um, whether or weigh in whether or not those are areas that we should continue to pursue as a wind energy area. And as you can see, if we take both those areas, the primary and secondary recommendations, or dark green and light green together, you have about 800,000 acres. Um, with little under 10 gigawatts of potential energy. So right now we're going to go through each of the call areas themselves and describe our winnowing process and give a little insight as to how each of those areas were determined. So let's start in the north with fairways north. You'll see the wind energy area, the light green and dark green areas depicted on the left. And on the right we have a list of factors. These are uh, the main factors that were influential in decisions for this particular call area. They are not in a particular order. We're not saying one is more important than the other, but really we, we're trying to um, describe the main factors that were considered in choosing these areas. So in particular, in Fairways North, we had three nominations in this region, uh, which was a, a healthy amount uh, in terms of developer interests. We also considered visual impacts and historic properties. The Fairways North call area was within a area that was identified by the state of New York as being potentially um, to have a visual impact between that 17 and 20 nautical mile bands that was considered as part of our analysis. Uh, for marine protected species, 
the National Marine Fisheries Service conducted an analysis on all of the call areas and for marine protected species identified an area in the northeast of off of Block Island that was a biologically important feeding area for several species of whales. And that area actually overlapped with a small portion of the northeast corner of this particular call area. And since a biologically important uh, feeding area is not something that is statically spatially explicit, they also included a 10 nautical mile buffer around that. And so if, you're, if you were to include that buffer, it does include uh, a significant portion of the north um, and eastern portions of this call area. In addition, this call area as well has several submarine cables that run through it. And, and we'll discuss this in, in several of the call areas. And while cables themselves are not something that would um, result in an area being undevelopable, you know, one is able to develop uh, cable crossing agreements and build around them. We do acknowledge that the presence of cables, especially several cables in high density, could uh, result in increased costs in, for developments. So that's something we considered. As discussed at our public meetings in September and recorded online as a webinar, the map here discusses or, or displays some of the results of our fisheries analysis and how it was incorporated in our planning activities. The area in pink was an area from the fisheries perspective that was recommended to be removed due to ex fishing existing uses, while the area in green and dark green was recommended as a potential area that could coexist with offshore wind. As a reminder, the fisheries analysis was based on a relative use index, which is discussed in greater detail on our webinar, as well as input from several fisheries groups and the comments we received on the call. Or the eastern end of the recommended areas in dark green, that border is largely there because of that's where the recommendation for fisheries uh, and stops. When it comes to vessel navigation, there are several things to consider in this region. The first one I'll highlight is the tug and tow corridor or potential tug and tow corridor, which is outlined in between the yellow lines depicted on this map. The distance between those lines is nine nautical miles. And that's there because we recognize that the Coast Guard is currently going through a process by which to officially designate a corridor or fairway to account for existing tug and tow traffic uh, that move through this portion of the New York Bight. We don't know exactly where that corridor will end up, so we're highlighting this area as a potential unknown or potential caveat as part of our draft and injury process. And that's why you have a portion of that being in light green that overlaps the potential corridor. Also for navigation, we have this red hatched area uh, to the south. That's something that was recommended as part of the uh, AC PARS U.S. Coast Guard study and something that we're trying to incorporate throughout our process. So moving to fairways south, several of the similar factors in fairways north were also considered. In terms of nominations, we did receive several in this area and they focused on the western portion of the call area. Uh, again, visual and historic properties were also considered given its proximity to shore. There happened to be a higher concentration of cables in this particular call area towards the eastern side of it, which was one of the reasons why the eastern side was not considered as a wind energy area or recommended to be considered as a wind energy area. And uh, for marine protected species, it's not as if there is a area um, designated as a, for example, biologically important feeding area. Uh, but we did receive several comments uh, that discusses the potential effect of increased, increased traffic in this region that would uh, potentially result in uh, increased threat to marine species. So for example, if a marine mammal or a whale was transiting from the north to south, uh, in order to get from Long Island area out into the ocean, they'd have to pass through a uh, two navigation fairways as well as a wind energy area and all the increased traffic and vessel traffic that comes with that would potentially raise the threat to um, vessel strike for marine species. So that's one of the reasons why portions of this was removed. For recreational and commercial fishing, we noticed that based on our relative use index, there's a relatively higher concentration of fisheries through the central and eastern portion of fairways south 
And the area that is identified as being recommended for a wind energy area was one that had a um, relatively less usage for fishing. For vessel navigation, you'll see some similar layers here. The area between the two yellow lines depicting a potential tug and tow corridor, as well as the two nautical mile separation or buffer from the traffic separation schemes. And you can see that that is one of the reasons why some of the areas um, underneath are in light green and not dark green. So moving to Hudson North, we have two wind energy areas designated here, one in the northwest corner and one on the southern portion. We did receive several nominations, um, higher nominations in, in general in, in the Hudson North and Hudson South areas than in the fairways areas. Uh, but notable here is that there were no nominations in the northeast finger, if you will, of Hudson North. And that's one of the reasons why that was removed. Um, as well as considering some of the cable uh, density in that region, which is very similar to the density in the fairway south region. We acknowledge that this is a large area and it's heavily used by recreational and commercial fishermen, specifically scallop and squid fishermen, and utilize the relative use index that was part of our fisheries analysis to help inform where wind energy, energy areas should go. So if we focus on the region up in the northwest portion, that area is recommended for several reasons, one of which is it has relatively less use with our relative use index. It's also an area that was recommended for offshore wind energy development by the Sir Clam and Ocean Quahog industry. It is also relatively close to shore and relatively um, shallower bottom depths compared to er other areas, which decreases the potential cost for development. When it comes to navigation, there are certainly some issues here that we want to make sure people are aware of. So again, we're, we're incorporating some familiar layers, the tug and tow corridor between uh, those two yellow lines, the nine nautical mile width, does go right through the wind energy area recommended in the northwest corner. And we acknowledge that as a potential issue. And I, I'd say that's a pretty big caveat for that area, but do acknowledge that there's a potential that um, the fairway could be placed in such a way for potential coexistence. A new uh, hatch here is this blue uh, crossed hatch, which is indicating a, a traffic separation team spread. So if you look at our uh, AIS data for this region, you'll see that vessels tend to come out of the traffic separation schemes and head the most direct route to their destination. So they kind of fan out once they get out of that restricted area. And so if, if we were to not consider leasing or, or offering wind energy area in the areas that are hatched in that blue, um, we would be responsive and, and able to accommodate existing traffic patterns that we see in the AIS data. However, as you can tell, we're recommending an area that is directly within that spreading zone. And so that's one of the things we're looking for feedback on. Um, this area to the south, the, the dark green area, is a portion that overlaps um, a, another recommendation for fisheries. And the light green areas are also areas that um, also are, are relatively less used for fishing, but not quite to the degree that the dark green is. So what we've done here is we recognize that this is one of the areas that um, is not necessarily conflicted by a, the fairways process up in the, in the north with the tug and tow corridor. And it's an area that is not necessarily um, negatively impacted by, by a DOD assessment, or it's not an area that the DOD has a potential issue with or potential concern with development. So we wanted to say, okay, if this area were to be developed, we want to make sure there's enough space that it would be commercially viable. So that's why we kind of ratcheted it up, if you will, a relative use index, and we have the areas in light green. So this is one of the, the important areas you want to make sure that uh, folks are able to discuss and, and um, provide their input on at the task force meeting. Moving to Hudson South. Now this area is relatively large compared to the others. And again, um, considering some similar aspects. So developer nominations, we did receive the highest number of nominations in Hudson South. Some areas uh, receiving as many as five overlapping nominations. 
So, so certainly uh, those were also concentrated in the central western portion of the call area. We also recognize that there's considerable fishing activity in this region. Um, New Jersey has several recreational fishing areas that they've recommended or asked that were to be excluded. Uh, we have clam and ocean, sir clam and ocean quahog uh, activities in the central western portion here, scallops, um, squid, and others on, on kind of the edges. But what we do see is, a, again, a relatively um, less used area in the southern or south eastern portion of Hudson South. So that's where you get this dark green recommendation. And part of the dark green recommendation is also that that's an area that is not included in, in this part of the spreading aspect. So that dark green um, was an area that was recommended based on our fisheries analysis and also recommended based on navigation analysis. And I should mention too that uh, the recommendations that I'm referencing, if you're curious for more information there, please go back and review uh, the webinar that's on for our September uh, outreach activities where we have some subject matter experts discussing that in further detail. You'll note too that the, the light green area in Hudson South is quite large and this area is to try and, we're, we're trying to highlight this area to get more information from the task force to um, identify potential conflicts within this area and, and further refine that if possible. That concludes our discussion of how we got to the draft in energy areas. Hopefully you have a basic understanding of the factors we considered when making that decision and are able to come to the task force meeting on November 28th ready to discuss that and provide input to inform our decision making process. So the road ahead uh, involves a, a task force meeting in New York City on November 28th. Following that task force meeting, BOEM will make a decision deciding what the final wind energy areas are and announce those in early 2019. The next step after that is a proposed sale notice and based on that schedule we'll end up with that in summer of 2019 followed by a final sale notice in late 2019 and a early um, 2020 lease sale. Thank you very much for taking the time today to listen to this briefing and gain a better understanding of how we developed our draft wind energy areas. I do acknowledge that there's a lot of complexity and a lot of factors that were considered and this um, presentation does not claim to do it all 100% justice. So please, if you have additional questions and you'd like to get some more information, please feel free to reach out to Jim Bennett or myself and we'll do our best to answer questions before the task force meeting. Thank you very much for your time.